We have 17 or 18 of them across the country joining us. And, and the history of the Trudeau, when Father Tom was the director, he used to have the provincial come in and give the talk every year. So when I was provincial from 96 to 2004, for those eight years, I came and gave the talk. And I was reminded yesterday that I used to start with uh, some jokes and I haven't been doing that. So in honor of that, I'm going to tell you a few of my jokes. Um, most of them were sent in by Holy Family Institute members because I had a few and then as I did it every year that I would show up and people would have my sheets that type things. So, so a lot of those came from others. And then I will conclude with the very first joke that I told. But the first one is called the best patients. Five surgeons are overheard discussing who makes the best surgical patient. Sur a surgeon one says, <clears throat> I like to see accountants on my operating table because when you open them up, everything inside is numbered. <laughs> the second surgeon said, yeah, but you should try electrician. Everything inside of them is colorful. The third surgeon says, no, I really think librarians are the best because everything inside them is in alphabetical order. <laughs> The fourth surgeon responded, you know, I like construction workers. Those guys understand when you have a few parts left over at the end and when the job takes longer than you said it would. <laughs> Here's a good one for this year. Finally, the fifth surgeon spoke up. You are all wrong. Politicians are the easiest to operate on. There's no gut, no heart, no spine, and the head, and the head and the butt are interchangeable. <laughs> this one's called a walk to school. It's a little more spiritual. Timmy was a five-year-old boy that his mother loved very much. Being a worrier, she was concerned about him walking to school when he started kindergarten. So she walked him to school the first couple of days, but when he came home one day, he told his mother that he did not want her walking him to school every day. He wanted to be one of the big boys. He protested so loudly that she had an idea on how to handle it. She asked the neighbor, Mrs. Goodnest, if she would quickly follow her son to school at a distance behind him, that he would not likely notice, but close enough to keep a watch on him. Mrs. Goodness said that since she was up early with her toddler anyway, it would be a good way for them to get some exercise as well. So she agreed. The next school day, Mrs. Goodness and her little girl, Marcy, set out following behind Timmy as he walked to school with another boy from the neighborhood. She did this for the whole week. And as the boys walked and chatted, kicking stones and twigs, the little friend of Timmy noticed that this same lady was following them, as she seemed to do every day of the week. Finally, he said to Timmy, have you noticed that lady following us all week? Do you know her? Timmy nonchalantly replied, yeah, I know who she is. Well, who is she? That's just surely goodness, Timmy said. Surely goodness? Who the heck is she and why is she following us? Here we go. Well, Timmy explained, every night my mom makes me say the 23rd Psalm with my prayers because she worries about me so much. And in it, the Psalm says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the rest of the days of my life. So I guess I'll just have to get used to it. Okay, one more and then our final. Um, a young executive was leaving the office late one evening when he found the CEO of the company standing in front of a shredder with a piece of paper in his hand. Listen, said the CEO, this is a very sensitive and important document here and my secretary has gone for the night. Can you make this thing work? Certainly, said the young executive. He turned the machine on, inserted the paper, and pressed the start button. 
excellent, excellent, said the CEO as his paper disappeared inside the machine. I just need one copy. <laughs> Standing in front of the shredder. Okay. Okay, here's the very first one that I ever read. It was sent to me by a, a member. And uh, well, I guess it might not be the first because they wouldn't have sent it to me without me doing it. Anyway, the first. And this comes in like four parts. After Quasimodo's death, the bishop of the cathedral at Notre Dame sent word through the streets of Paris that a new bell ringer was needed. The bishop decided that he would conduct the interviews personally and went up into the belfry to begin the screening process. After observing several applicants demonstrate their skills, he decided to call it a day when a long, armless man approached him and announced that he was there to apply for the bell ringer's job. The bishop was incredulous. You have no arms. No matter, said the man, observe. And then he began striking the bells with his face, producing a beautiful melody on the corridor. The bishop listened in astonishment and convinced that he had finally found a suitable replacement for Cosimo. Suddenly, rushing forward to strike a bell, the armless man tripped and plunged headlong out of the belfry window to his death in the street. The stunned bishop rushed to his side, and when he reached the street, a crowd had gathered around the fallen figure, drawn by the beautiful music they had heard only moments before. And as they silently parted to let the bishop through, one of them said, Bishop, who was this man? I don't know his name, the bishop sadly replied, but his face rings a bell. <laughs> okay, brace yourself, there's more. The following day, despite the sadness that weighed heavily on his heart due to the unfortunate death of the armless the panologist, the bishop continued his interview for the bell ringer of Notre Dame. The first man to approach him said, Your Excellency, I am the brother of the poor armless wretch that fell to his death from this very belfry yesterday. I pray that you honor his life by allowing me to replace him in this duty. The bishop agreed to give the man an audition, and as the armless man's brother stooped to pick up a mallet to strike the first bell, he groaned, clutched at his chest, and died on the spot. Yes. Two monks, hearing the bishop's cries of grief at this second tragedy, rushed up the stairs to his side. What has happened? The first breathlessly asked. Who is this man? I don't know his name, sighed the distraught bishop, but he's a dead ringer for his brother. <laughs> the tragic story continues. When the news of the second bell ringer's death reached the community at large, it was so distressing to them that to a man they wrung their hands. The sound produced by the ringing of the hands, however, was not as pleasing to the bishop as that of the bells, so he continued his search for the vital replacement. Finally, after a long agonizing quest, he found an old man who seemed to be the answer to his search. Although he gave evidence of being a bit eccentric, the old man did have extensive experience and approached the task with a great deal of confidence. He set up a large string of beads around the bells and commenced to ring out in an exemplary fashion. And when the bishop ascended the campanilla to tell the old man he was hired, he was puzzled to see the beads strung around the bells. And when he inquired about them, the answer he received convinced him that only trouble lay ahead if he engaged the old man. So he dismissed him on the spot. And when asked what was said that caused the bishop summarily to dismiss the old man, the bishop shook his head and replied, he said, I like to ring around the rosary. <laughs> nope, it's not over. Even more, one more section. The tragedies and the dismissal of the previous days left the cathedral with a continued bell ringer vacancy. All previous applicants had withdrawn, fearing that this position was now cursed. The bishop retired to his garret to ponder the situation 
when a maiden from the south of France knocked at his door. She explained that she was from a family of bell ringers stretching back 10 generations. In honor of the memory of the ill-fated applicants preceding her, she felt it her duty to offer her bell ringing services to the bishop. The bishop was delighted to accept her offer, even though she imposed two conditions. First, she was to receive no salary for her work, and second, the bishop was bound to keep her identity a secret. The next morning, the sound of bells once again drew a crowd to the square in front of the cathedral. The young lady was indeed very talented, and as the bishop walked through the crowd, he was pleased to see that the populace approved of his choice of ringers. And as he was about to enter the church, an elderly man approached the bishop and asked him about the new bell ringer. The old man had heard that this new ringer was ringing in honor of someone, and he wanted to know who the bell ringer was, and in whose honor these peals were now ringing forth, and if the parish could afford such a talented ringer. The bishop paused for a moment, bound by his promise to the young lady, and remember young lady is the key to this final phrase, and he could only reply, do not ask for whom the bell tolls, the bell tolls for free. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. That's what people send me. That's what I should. Okay, um, we finished yesterday with our conferences, actually the Complete My Joy. And again, you can find it uh, download if you want a copy, send an email to me at the HFI uh, uh, email and uh, I'll send you a copy. But I'd like to finish off by looking at one of the conferences that came from the Theology of the Body um, Institute, uh, had a, a big seminar on the weekend back in um, uh, May. And so this is from um, Katrina Zeno, and she writes about the theology of the body, human happiness, and the four holy communions. And so I'd like to share that with you this morning. When we're looking at human happiness, she quotes Aristotle, who said, happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life. We like to be happy. We want to be happy. Either in our complete our joy, we look after the happiness of our spouse, the people around us. And this is not just a feeling, but it is a state of perfection. It's the fullness of what we all strive to be, not only a sense of love and care for one another, but our sense of happiness in our life. And so what we look for is reaching out for this human happiness, and this is what we are created for. She tells us that our human nature is in the incarnation. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnation. Divine nature brings human nature to the fullness of what it was meant to be, the uh, hypostatic union. So the fullness of what we want to be and that happiness and in that love, as we've talked about, we want to be part of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. So we want to be part of the happiness that they have. So the incarnation, the divine nature took on human nature, allows us to reach that full potential of happiness in our own life as well. So when you look at the incarnation, there are four options that you can approach on how this works. And the fourth one is the one that we like. The other three, not so good. The first one would be, did divine, did divinity swallow up humanity so that human nature was absorbed into divine nature and disappeared? So that's one concept. Is that the way we look at the incarnation? The divine came down, took on humanity and absorbed it all, and now it's disappeared and it's just divine? No. Did divine nature wrestle with human nature to dominate it and override its impulses? So there's still a little bit of uh, humanity there, but divinity overwhelms it, keeps its impulses down and focuses more on divinity. No, that's not it either. The third, did divine nature with human nature 
create a kind of half God, half man, 50-50 mixture. No, that didn't happen either. Did divine nature unite with human nature so that there was a perfect unity of the two, a perfect union in communion? Yes. That unity of humanity and divinity in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we are called to unite ourselves because we are the body of Christ. We want to have that divinity within us. We want to create that union. And so this is how we achieve that happiness. And the fullness of that happiness is that we align ourselves with the Lord. So we are so united to be one flesh in the body of Jesus Christ. We already experience We already have perfect union with communion. In the incarnation, we might say, is a wedding between divinity and humanity. And God unites with us so that we are one. And then she quotes Ephesians 5, 31, 30 to 31. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And again, very much the emphasis of the theology of the body that St. John Paul II presented for many years. Looking at the two shall become one. Talking about marriage talking about our bodies being united together. So here we're looking at a perfect union with communion, that God unites with us so that we are one. We are the body of Christ. And therefore we join with one another as the body of Christ. Not only as husband and wife in their marriage and in their union, but all of us are united together. So therefore, when we talk about being the body of Christ, we also talk about being the church, and the church is the body of Christ. And we are the church so that we can have communion with God. And we talked about today how important the Mass was, how important the Eucharist. And again, while we emphasize and say during this time, yes, it's, it's nice to have the the virtual masses, and it's nice to see them on television, and we talk about, quote, spiritual communions that we say people have, even though they're not with us. Many people say, I miss receiving the body of Christ. Yes, I can hear the word of God. Yes, I can be with other people, but I miss receiving the body of Christ. And that's essential to what we are as the church. So we already experience one flesh, holy union and communion with God in the Eucharist, in the host. We become one with that. So when we go out the door after we receive the Eucharist, we are basically the body of Christ. We are Christ for others. We are the church. And we always talk about how do we look when we walk out the door. And the classic example is they're already arguing over getting out of the parking lot. Now, I tell my story, you might have heard this before, when I was at the nursing home here in uh, Austin once. We were going there since the early 60s. Unfortunately, we haven't been there since the COVID-19 has come, but we were normally going every Sunday for Mass. And we usually are in their bigger hall for the Mass, but this one time they were preparing that hall or doing something, and we were in this small chapel. And first of all, the chapel is an old style where the altar is like up against the wall. So I was sort of doing a, a hybrid type of thing, you know, the Lord here, the people here, because I wasn't used to putting my back to the people. Anyway, there was a lot of people in the pews, and there were a lot of people coming in with uh, wheelchairs. And so we had just finished the Mass, and then everybody was trying to leave. And so they all turned and started locking their their wheels and their um, footrest and everything. And in the midst of this was a man who wasn't in a wheelchair. And he says, let's get the F out of here. And I said, excuse me, we just had mass. 
And I said, uh, you know, that's not the way we have to do it. So we are the body of Christ and we have gone out. And so we have to remind ourselves that we are in union with the Lord. And we believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, humanity and divinity. And when we receive, we become one body with Christ. We have become what we have been created for. God created us to have a union with us, to bring us his happiness, to bring his presence. So in the Eucharist, we are both union and communion, union with the Lord, communion with one another. In the Eucharist, we receive the pledge of our bodily resurrection. There is the resurrection of the body. That's what we believe. Easter celebration, it celebrates the resurrection of the body. Jesus rose from the dead and promises that we can as well. We celebrate our own resurrection of the body, not just the resurrection of Jesus. We believe we'll have the glorified body in heaven. Any pain, any illness, any sickness we may have had will all be gone. We're in resurrection with the Lord. And we are created to be body and soul resurrected, not just the soul. We talked about the immortality of the soul, yes, but we also believe that we will have the body to go with us. So Katrina Zena speaks about four communions, incarnation, the Eucharist, the resurrected body, and marriage. So she talks, first of all, it says that marriage is the visible sign of Trinitarian love. And we talked about that from the complete my joy. So if we look at the Trinity, the Trinity, the Father pours himself out in a total gift of love to his Son. Total. Love. God is love. The Son pours himself out in a total gift of love back to the Father. So they are giving themselves total love because they are love. They are one being. And then the Holy Spirit overflows as the fruit of their total love, self-giving love. So that becomes the outpouring of their love, the outpouring of the love they have for one another. So the Father and the Son totally giving their love to each other, so much so that it overflows into the Spirit and comes forth being sent to others, being sent to us. So the Trinity is the total gift of self in love. So that is seen then for us in the incarnation, the total love that God had for humanity joined with us to bring his love to all of humanity. then we in turn share that with one another. Then we in turn focus on returning that love back to the Lord in our resurrected body. And also when we talk about the theology of the body, it's the relationship between husband and wife and giving their total love to one another. So just like the Trinity in marriage, the husband pours himself out in a total gift of love to his wife. And the wife pours herself a total gift of love to her husband. That commitment, that love. And the overflow of that love then can come out in the gift of the love to um, their total gift self overflows with a life giving love, which could be to children and it could be given to others. So we give that witness as members of the Holy Family Institute, as husbands and wives. 
to show that we have given that commitment. And we extend that love to our children, to our grandchildren, or to others. And so is there that outpouring. Christ makes a total gift of self and love through his body. He was here physically at some point. And physically, he was reaching out and caring for people, healing them, curing them, performing miracles. He was the word made flesh, gave the word of God, shared the Lord's presence with others. He also gives himself in the cross. He offered himself in love to overcome sin, to overcome death, that he loved us so much he was willing to die for us. And he gives himself totally in the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. And as we know, he's full and complete in both species. So if you only receive the body and not the blood, you have the fullness of Christ. If you can only receive the blood and not the body, you have the fullness of Christ. And it's that total love, that total gift, do this in remembrance of me, keep this going, remind people that they are the body of Christ, remind I am always with you. Our words, do not be afraid, from here I will enlighten you, be sorry for sins. From the tabernacle, from the real presence. And husband and wife make a total gift of themselves in love, through their bodies, through their sexual union, giving themselves completely and totally over to their spouse, just as Jesus gave himself to all of us. This is my body given up for you, Jesus Christ says, and all couples say. I'm sharing it, I'm giving this because I love you and want to do all the best for you. Marriage is a sign of the inner life of the Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit, as we just mentioned, is within marriage. Marriage is a sign of unity, of divinity and humanity. We're bringing that presence of Jesus Christ and the Trinity into our relationship as husbands and wives in our marriage. And also marriage is a sign of unity of love between Christ and his church. You are the body of Christ. You are the people of God. You are the church. So these four communions, the incarnation, divinity takes on humanity, the Eucharist, where he shares his presence with us, the resurrected body joining back to the Lord and marriage or communions where we are united in some way with our Lord Jesus Christ shows us what we are all created for, not just married couples, but all of us are to make our gift of love of God through others. We see others now as the body of Christ. We see the presence of Jesus in others. We want to share the love with them. So whether it's friends that we have, maybe it's the call of marriage, maybe it's the celibate call for us priests, brothers, and sisters in religious life. All of us are called to share the love of God in our respective states. And now we know our reason for creation is that happiness that the Lord is bringing to us in the fullness of our relationship with Jesus Christ, fullness in our relationship with the Lord. We are united with the Lord in the Eucharist, in the redemption that we are going to receive from the Lord, and in our own calling, whatever it may be. The challenge will be given to those who are single and how can they help to find or give a definition of their deep and authentic of human happiness. 
but in their friendships, in their relationships with others who are married, in their relationships with those they know, priests, brothers, and sisters. It's not a lesser, it's a different call. Now, our Annunciationists and Gabrielites, our single men and women, have consecrated themselves to the vows. And so there's that commitment they have. But for those who are single and have not made the commitment either to religious life, to consecrated life, to marriage, they still can participate in there. And there was another talk elsewhere where a lady talked about the theology of the body and, and for single people. But I won't go into that as well. But I thought this one's very interesting because it reminds us of the four holy communions, our presence with the Lord, the presence with uh, Christ within us, and how we are to share that in our married life and in all of our callings to recognize that we are seeing each other as the body of Christ, see each other as the people of God and how we share that with others. And so I'm going to conclude our conference here this morning with that. Thank you.